Uh, open your Bibles, if you have them, or look here on the screen, Luke chapter 18. And listen to this reading. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, not murder, not steal, not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Everybody shout, you still lack one thing. <clears throat> Sell everything, shout everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, those who heard this asked the same question we're asking this morning. Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Shout amen. God, here's what we want you to do. We don't just want head knowledge. We do want head knowledge. So help us to hear and learn. But we want to walk out of here with different hearts than what we came in. Would you do that? We open ourselves to you. We give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name. Shout amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> All right, let me tell you where we're going so that you can track me during the course of this message. Luke is writing this uh, story, and Luke wants us to read chapter 18 together with chapter 19. Because those of you who have your Bibles, or whatever, if you turn the page or just go shift over to chapter 19, you'll find immediately there is a story about a wealthy man. Now, what Luke wants you to connect is this. He wants you to hear the disciples, he, he wants you to hear Jesus saying how difficult it is for wealthy people, and by the way, if we live here in America and compare it to the rest of the world, we all in a, in a wealthy category. Tell the person next to you, surprise, you're wealthy, tell them. <laughs> that, that, um, that, he wants you to hear Jesus saying, how difficult it is for, for wealthy people to enter into the kingdom of God. And he wants you to hear uh, the folks standing around Jesus give voice to what we would, we would be uh, tempted to say. Well, who then can be saved? And then Luke wants you to turn the page with that in the back of your mind. How difficult it is for wealthy people to enter the kingdom of God. Then Turn the page, shout, turn the page, then turn the page, and he immediately wants you to read a story about a wealthy guy by the name of Zacchaeus. I talked about him three weeks ago. A wealthy guy by the name of Zacchaeus, so anxious to see uh, Jesus when Jesus comes to Jericho, that he, he runs ahead, climbs up a tree. When Jesus comes under the tree, he looks up, calls him by name, Zacchaeus, get on down here. Zacchaeus comes down with joy and excitement. Jesus says, I want to dine in your home today. I have to. And, and he goes to Jesus' house. Everybody's murmuring, how can this Jesus go to this horrible sinner's house? And, and, and there in the midst of a dinner, I don't know what Jesus said. I don't know what he taught. But somehow he revealed who he was and his extravagant love for Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus in response stands up. This rich man, shout rich man. Rich man stands up and says, oh Lord. Lord, he says, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, we know he had cheated a lot because he was the chief tax collector of folk out of their taxes. He said, look, I'm going to pay them. And the law says, give them two times back. But I'm going to give them four times back. And then Jesus stands up and says, uh, uh, he says, man, salvation has come to this house today. In other words, Lucas wants you to hear one hand, how difficult it is for wealthy people to get saved. On the other hand, Zacchaeus, a wealthy man, is easily saved by the grace and extravagant love of Jesus in his house. That's the connection we're trying to make. 
You want to hold these two guys together as we go through. Now, let me step back. I've titled this, this series, Dream Crazy, Big Dreams. You know why? If you were here a few weeks ago, I, I told you. Because we have a crazy big God that has shaped us to dream crazy big dreams. As a matter of fact, I want to give you some homework today. I want to challenge you to do something that you may have never done in your life before. One of the ways we know that God has shaped us to dream crazy big dreams is he's given us this incredible imagination. And most of us take our imagination for granted and use it only for us. Here's your homework. I want to challenge you to go home today, take about five or ten minutes, get in a corner somewhere, and say, God, this remarkable imagination that you've given me, I'm giving it back to you. I want you to take my imagination and turn it into a, a, a canvas in your, in your hand and begin to draw the pictures of the dreams that you have for me and for my role in your plan. Draw those on my mind. I'm challenging you to go home. We just said, use me. Help me give myself. Go give your imagination to God. Try it. Tell the person next to you, as the commercial used to say, try it. You may like it. Tell them. <laughs> Crazy big dreams. Whether you are 17 years old or 75 years old, this is the point I'm trying to make. God wants you to dream crazy big dreams. One of my favorite scriptures is Jeremiah uh, one five. What's the wording to the scripture? It blows my mind whenever I read it. This is what God is saying to some of us. He says, "Listen." He says, "He says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, shout before, before you were a protoplasmic substance in your mother's womb, shout before." Before you were in your mama's womb, he says, I had you in my will. I knew you. And I set you apart before you were born. And I appointed you to be a prophet, not to a small town, to be a prophet, not to the region that you're in, to be a prophet, not just to your nation. But I, I'm telling you now, at 17, I'm pulling back the curtain so you can see what I want you to dream about. I've appointed you to be a prophet to the nations, shout nations. In other words, God is challenging him at 17 years old. Dream crazy big dreams as a part of my plan for the world. Abraham and Sarah, because he comes to both of them, uh, the, the promise goes to both of them. In Genesis 12, there, Abraham is 75 years old, and Sarah is 65. Is there anybody in here 75 or older? Can I see your hands? Come on. This is, I know you. Yes, beautiful. Wonderful. Is there anybody in here 65 or older? Let me see your hands. Wonderful. God's talking to you right now. And here's what, he's, he, 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 here's what he said to 65-year-old Sarah and 75-year-old Abram before their name was changed to father of many nations and mother of many nations, Abraham and Sarah. Here's what he said to them, verse 3. He says, essentially, he says, I want you to dream bigger dreams. He says, I, I know you're wealthy. I know you're in recreational mode. I know you think everything is behind you. But no, 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 no. Uh, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And, 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 and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you, through your seed. And for the next 25 years, it looked like, they looked like uh, God had forgotten about his promise, but they kept dreaming, they kept believing. And guess what? The Jewish community and the Christian community is here today because God kept the promise to Abraham and Sarah. All comes out of that space. You know what God is saying? Dream crazy big dreams. I don't care how old you are. Dare you? Now, here's the question. When you dream those dreams, you have to ask yourself, what is the character of my dreams? 
And, and here's how you determine the character of your dreams. It's not so much about what the actual dream is as much as it is about the why behind the dream, right? And, 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 and here's what I want. Here's how you test your dreams. Figure out which one of these phrases best describes. Think about the dreams you've had. Think about the dreams that you might dream now for your family and for the next generation. Think of, think, just, just think of your dreams. I don't know, can you just kind of get them in your mind right now? And here's, what I, here's the test I want you to measure them by. Which one of these phrases best describes your dream? My dream is mostly about what I can acquire or my dream is mostly about what I can give. My dream is mostly about how to get the world around me to serve me or my dream is mostly about how can I get a bigger platform, get more resources to serve the world, to serve something bigger than myself, to serve a God-sized plan, to help heal sick people, to to bless poor people, to, to, to eradicate injustice from the world, or to just make somebody smile today. I, 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 which one of those? Let me be honest, think about it. Because if you're more, if you're like most of us, it's in the what I can acquire category. And oh, if I can help somebody, I got some leftovers for that. That's okay. I want you to grab the dream because Jesus can redeem it. And the fact that you're here today means he wants to redeem. He's working on it now. The fact that you're thinking about it critically. It's already started the redemption process to your dreams. Now, that's where these two guys are. Exactly where you're sitting, that's where they were sitting in this text. The guy that we read about is often referred to as the rich, young ruler. I find no indication in the text that he's young. I don't know what his age is, but we do know he's a ruler. The text calls him that a magistrate, an officer, somebody with influence and power. And we do know that he's rich because in verse 23, it identifies the fact that he's very rich, which is part of the challenge. And Zacchaeus, we we know from verse 1 and 2 that that he's a chief tax collector in his region, and he's very wealthy. He's very, very, very rich. Let's look at some of the things that they have in common. Let's just, uh, so first of all, they're both wealthy. Shout, they're wealthy. All right. Secondly, they're both Jewish. Shout, Jewish. All right, let me make this point. Do you know that Christianity was literally and figuratively born out of the womb of Judaism? Did you know that? Do you know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Jewish? Do you know that Jesus was Jewish? Do you know that the disciples that he, that became the apostles were Jewish? Do you know that the writers of the New Testament that shapes our understanding of grace and saved by grace through faith were Jewish? Paul was Jewish, do you, 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 you get that the Old Testament that gives us a lot of our stories is what the Jewish community calls their Hebrew Bible, that from the Old Testament to the New, that Christianity is tied uniquely to Judaism? Oh, the, 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 here's, 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 here's the proof. In Revelation chapter 5, in one of my favorite passages, there below the throne, it talks about the 24 elders, shout 24 24, and that's John, who's a Jewish writer, who is also a follower of Jesus. Uh, he writes the 24, and what he's, what he's imagining when the culmination of the age, he's imagining 12 of the 24 represents the patriarchal heads of the 12 tribes, the Jewish nation. The other 12 represents the apostles from which we get to church. And together, shout 24, 
24 elders are gathered around the throne of God, giving God praise. And in the center of the throne, come on now, is Jesus, the Lamb of God. And he links the two communities together. Well, that's why I picked up the phone to call Rabbi Ezra of this, the rabbi of this synagogue. And I wanted him to know last night, and I want to make it absolutely clear today. I said to him that I and NBCC, we stand with you during this horrible moment. We stand with CBJ. We stand with Tree of Life congregation. And we stand with the Jewish community because that's where Jesus would be standing if he was here. Just in case you were wondering. And he thanked us. That's why I'm going to join him tonight at that vigil. Because there's no space or place for the hatred that we're witnessing in the world. Shout Jewish. Both of these guys were Jewish. Attending to the same culture, the same religious tradition. Thirdly, shout curious. They both were curious. Uh, Zacchaeus is so curious, he climbs a tree so he can see. Uh, the rich young ruler, uh, he approaches Jesus with a question out of his curiosity. You see, because I believe that at the end of the day, he had been, he had been around. He had been, he had been waiting around listening to Jesus teach. And if you read that whole chapter, you'll figure out what he was teaching. You know, he, he started off talking about, we, we call it the persistent prayer parable. But really what he's teaching is, is to be persistent in your prayer for justice. And he tells a story about a widow who went to an unjust king, a judge, and she just bugged him until finally he had to give her justice. And he was basically saying to, to the people around that he was talking to, I know it looks like unjust injustice is here to stay, but you keep praying, you keep working, you keep believing. God will bring justice by and by, just keep trusting. And then he hears Jesus, he talks about, you know, they would bring the little babies to him. That's what we do on baby dedication week, weekend. And then he would bring the little babies to him. His disciples, it's like it's secret service. They say, oh, no, no, get them away from him. You don't need this. Babies are too important for babies. And he said, no, 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 bring these kids to me. He said, unless you learn to trust me and see me through the eyes of humble, innocent trust and, 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 and trust my love, like these kids, you won't get into the kingdom of God. And so he, he was listening. And he heard Jesus telling a little story about this, this Pharisee and this tax collector who went to the temple and they went to pray. And, and, the, and the Pharisee said, God, I'm so grateful that I, I pay my tithes and, and I keep the commandments. And I'm so glad that I'm not like this old, this, uh, this, this, this tax collector over here. I don't rob, I don't steal, I don't murder anybody. I'm just pretty bad, God. Can you just tell me I'm awesome, please? It was his prayer. And the tax collector wouldn't even look up. He said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says the tax collector left justified, redeemed. And that arrogant guy didn't know how much he needed God's grace. Left without God paying any attention. That prayer got stuck at the ceiling. Didn't get beyond. And so it created a curiosity in him. And so he went to Jesus. He finally said, Jesus, tell me what I should do to inherit eternal life. Now let me make this quick point. Whoever phone is ringing, you can answer it. That might be Jesus. <laughs> if there's a message, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll interrupt for Jesus. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Come on. <laughs> he, 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 uh, he, 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 I'd have forgotten my point, y'all. <laughs> Woo! All right. So, <clears throat> what must I do to inherit? Yes, curiosity. Here's my little point. Out of all that he had, he wasn't sure about his eternal life. Some missing. 
I wonder, is there anybody here who fit that category? Out of all you have, you're just not sure whether you have eternal, shout eternal. And he was curious. He was curious. If you think about this, follow me. He was curious and he comes to Jesus. And, 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 and let me just drop this point. I give him credit for going to Jesus. So let me drop this point. Never allow imperfect Jesus followers to stop you from being curious about Jesus. Man, scour those pages. That's what Matthew is here for. And Mark is here. And Luke and John. First five gospel books in the New Testament. Scour those pages. It is a good time to do it between now and Easter. Just start searching. Just read. Say, Jesus, I want to get to know you. I want to know who you are. And then, yes, show up in a community of unbroken, imperfect people. Because what you're going to discover is that Jesus specializes in taking broken, unholy, unworthy folk like you and me and saving us and sanctifying us and, and giving us value and a future. Oh, he says, what's, 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 what's impossible with man is possible with God. What we're suggesting is, I don't care how much money you have, you cannot secure your eternal just destiny. You can't do it. You need some help. You need some help. Oh, that gets me to the final comparison between the two of them. They both lacked something that money couldn't buy. Oh, I, my favorite scene is, as Luke describes chapter 19, Zacchaeus, and he says, uh, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but he was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. And, and I told you three weeks ago, you may recall, that I think he's not just being descriptive, he's being metaphorical. I think the best way to describe this, what kind of drove Zacchaeus up the tree, he's desperate to see, curious to see Jesus, is because Zacchaeus probably realized that, that, that he had a lot to account. He, after he counted all of his money, he had a lot of money, he, he counted all that money. And then after he, he, he counted up all his property, counted all of his property, he took assessment of that. Then he looked at all of his assets. Come on now. Maybe he had some CEDs and some investments. I don't know. He added all of that up. And after he finished adding all of that up, he discovered when it came to having eternal life, when it came to having eternal joy, when it came to having eternal peace, he still came up short. He didn't have enough. He didn't have. Something was missing. Could it be that for somebody here? Out of all you got, your education, and all that stuff, you're still coming up. Short. Oh. Uh, and then let's talk about some of the differences between the two. Shout differences. Oh, this is where the text gets excited. Just drop those differences up there. Just put them all at them. I'm going to walk them through. I'm going to put them all up there so they can see them all, right? Check this out. Watch this. One was asked to give away everything. That's the rich young ruler, and he didn't. The other, Zacchaeus, was not asked for anything, but he voluntarily gave up so much. Wow, what's the difference? All right, let's talk here. Uh, uh, here's, here's what's exciting. Jesus is skilled. In the conversation, how he, how he deals with us, because he always knows more about you than you know about you. <laughs> I wish I had time. I can't unpack it. So, so he, he says, he says, he says, why do you call me good? Only God alone is good. Are you suggesting, I think Jesus was implying, that you see in me something deeper than flesh? Perhaps you think I'm, there is some divinity. Would you have the, the courage and the nerve to articulate that? He says, while you think about it, let me go ahead and answer your question now. You know the commandments. And he runs through. Come on. No adultery, no murder, uh, no stealing, no lying. Take care of your parents. Watch it. Jesus and set him up. These are the five, the second half of the commandments. They're focused on behavior. 
and, and, and the lawyer doesn't see it. He doesn't see what good, because Jesus is going after his heart. And so he says, the lawyer says, I mean, the, the ruler says, well, I've, I've kept all these. Come on, now, he's like us. He's sitting in our seats. Right, right, right. I mean, most of us probably have his same testimony. You know, yeah, didn't, I haven't committed adultery, he says. I haven't murdered anybody, he says. I, I, I haven't stolen anything. I'm not a thief, he says. Uh, I'm not a liar, he says. Uh, uh, I, I do the best I can to take care and honor my parents. That's most of us, guys. And what he didn't realize was that while that was good, watch this. Jesus looks at him and he says, but you still lack one. Say one. There's five more we haven't talked about, but he says you lack one because the focus is on the heart, right? And, 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 and here's, here's kind of what he was suggesting. Watch this. He said, you forgot that the second five flow out of the first five. And the first five is about a relationship with an everlasting God. He said, if you decouple the, the two, the second five there are a lot of folk who don't even believe in God have that testimony. Well, a lot of folk who don't commit adultery, steal, lie, etc., and they don't ever come to, they don't believe in God. That's kind of the minimum of human decency. And so they can have all that, still miss the love of God. Come on, y'all ain't listen. He said, but, but if you understand how the structure, he said that these commandments are intended to flow out of a relationship with God. And the problem is, I'm going to point out to you that you've missed the very First commandment, thou shalt have no other God before. How are you going to point it out? Let me prove it. Go sell everything you got. Give it to the poor, store of treasures in heaven. Follow me. I'm on my way to the cross. I'm, I'm God in human understandable terms. Come, follow me. And... The text says, he became deeply sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus was saying, do you see it? Your ultimate God, the one who controls your life, is your wealth. Now, let me be literal. The closer you get to Jesus, the more he asks you for stuff. And he's got a right because he gave up everything. Shed his blood for you and for me. And the more he thinks he can depend on you, the more he asks you for stuff. Watch it. So let me be literal. I want you to go home and start praying this prayer. Lord, help me to become such a disciple that whatever you ask me for, I won't say no. Whatever you ask me for, I will say yes. Go pray that prayer. Because that's what he wants you. All right. But he didn't ask that kids for nothing. Why not? Oh, I like how y'all thinking today. Didn't ask Zacchaeus for nothing because when Zacchaeus came down the tree, watch it. This Jesus fella, he was already beginning to see that there was more to Jesus than just kind of a human expression. Because, because with all of his reputation, Jesus says, I want to go hang out at your house. And he said it in public. Come on now. And, 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 and everybody knew he was, a, he was a bad sinner, right? And Zacchaeus didn't have any problem with it. He knew he was a bad He knew he'd been robbing people and dogging people out, taking their homes and all that kind of stuff. He understood that. Uh, but Jesus says, I, I'm going to express to you extravagant grace, extravagant love. I'm going to go to your house and eat at your table. And when he gets there, I don't know what the lesson was. But then maybe he, maybe the lesson was what he shared at the end of 18 when he pulled the disciples apart and he told them, when I get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And you're going to see, and the world's going to see that I'm not just fully human. I'm fully God. I'm God with you. And, and maybe he shared a little bit of that. I don't know what he shared, but he shared enough for 
Zacchaeus to recognize, come on now, that, that, that here was the one that he should entrust his all to. Y'all ain't listening. Come on now. And, 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 and so this one right here, uh, uh, one didn't see himself. I talked about that one. The other guy thought he was good. Zacchaeus sees that he's sinful. He's not pretending. And then one couldn't trust. The guy couldn't trust Jesus. But this other one totally entrusted. Wow. Okay, here's my point. Here's how everlasting life works. You take your life and it links up through a relationship to an everlasting God. And it flows. And whatever Zacchaeus heard, he says, God, in Jesus, I surrender all to you. You're the new owner of my life. Oh, my goodness. Let me ask you the question. Which is true? You own your money and material gain or your money and material gain owns you? For the first, he was owned. That was his God. He, he served. But for Zacchaeus, come on now. He, when he realized who Jesus was, his eyes came open. And what he realized was, I, I, I thought I was the owner, but really, it all belonged to God anyway. Tell the person next to you, whatever you own is temporary. Tell somebody, some, tell them, somebody else going to have it by and by. Let me prove it. Die. Everything you got your name on going to somebody else. Come on now. The clothes you're wearing right now, somebody else going to wear those clothes. Come on now. The house, somebody else going to have it. You are a temporary owner. What that really means is you are a steward. It all belongs to God anyway. And when Zacchaeus realized that, he said, God, since you've been extravagant in your love and grace to me, I'm going to surrender all that I have to you. You don't have to ask me. I'm going to do it because I realize how how good you've been. One says, I think you're good. The other says, I've experienced your goodness. Come on now. Because I was humble enough to say, watch it, that I was a sinner. Are you humble enough to say you're a sinner? There's two traps you can fall in. One trap is my mother-in-law says people don't see themselves. Some of us always think we're better than what we are. We think we're nice when everybody knows we're mean. We think we're generous when everybody knows we're stingy. We see ourselves. Right now you're thinking, I'm not a sinner. Or you're thinking like the Pharisee in the text, I may be, but I'm not as bad as some folks. Which means you have no desperate need for God's grace. And if you don't need it, you can't see it. If you can't see it, you can't experience it. Oh my God. Now the other trap that people falls in is that you become, in a sense, prideful about your unworthiness. That you think you're so bad that even the love of God can't find you. So you come in here and hear a message like this and you say, I wish that spoke to me, but it did not. Zacchaeus showed us how to do it. Come on now. So just give God your all. Let him cover your life with the blood he shed on Calvary's cross. There must be something to you if he decide he's going to die for you. Come on now. So trust him even if you can't trust yourself. He says you're worth saving. You're worth redeeming. And if you just give me your all, come on now. I'll change your life. I'll change your dreams. I'll make you a part of my eternal plan. I'll take you just like you are, but I won't leave you the way I found you. Wow. My goodness. And so, you see, the response when you know how good God's been to you, you tend to be good. When you know how generous God's been to you, you tend to be, out of gratitude, generous. And so, Zachariah says, Jesus, you don't have to ask me. I want to do it. And I, I heard about what you're going to do for me. Let me do this. Let me invest in your kingdom. Half of what I got, I'm going to give to the poor. 
Because I know that's what you're concerned about. And if I've cheated anybody four times, I'm going to give away most of what I got. All right, here's, here's one of the ways you can assess the growth of your discipleship. Genuine, deepening discipleship ultimately reaches a point. Watch this. When one day you wake up and you are willing to exchange extravagant living for extravagant giving. Did you hear what I said? One day you wake up. You say, I don't need another car. The house is too big. Come on, you and nobody ask you. Just something's going on in your heart. And you're trying to figure out, how can I be a part of God's work in the world? How, how can I use my resources better than just on me? I, I don't really need all this stuff here. I, I got everything I could ever imagine. Uh, let, let me downsize, so some people are thinking, so that I can, act, I, can, I can take advantage. Let me not buy this house in Silicon Valley that's going to cost me, you know, $5 million. That's all right. I'm not going to leave the valley. I'm going to rent because there's a lot of God work needed in the valley. Come on now. But I'll use my excess. Y'all, let's see. I'm talking about somebody sold out for Jesus. I'll use my. Is that where you are? It's okay if you're not there or you're on the right road. So here it is. Put the last points up there. Lifestyle, put it up there. Lifestyle. So here's that kid has adopted a lifestyle. Now watch this. Let me end here. For some of you, you still have no real idea how much it costs Jesus to die for you. You can't really get your mind around it. So for some of us, I know he saved me. I'm a sinner. I know I would be. I'd be sleeping in my grave if it wasn't for Jesus' grace in my life. I know I don't have to tell nobody. I know he forgave me. He forgives me. He redeems me. I get it. I'm here because Jesus loves me. Extravagant. And he loves you. I know it. So my giving comes out of that. It's gratitude. I'm just trying to say thank you. But for some of you, it's not gratitude because you just don't really know it yet. So for you, it ought to be about identification. Here's what I mean. Because as you practice opening your hand, giving more, it hurts you. Somebody say, yeah, it hurts. Someone say, it hurts. Yeah, it's going to hurt you. But every time it hurts you, I want you to reflect on Jesus being hurt for you on Calvary's cross. And you're saying, I'm identifying just a little bit more with him in his work of salvation for me. And then you give a little bit more, and it's going to hurt a little bit more. And you keep saying, but Jesus, I want to be with you in your suffering. Paul says, if I can know him in the fellowship of his suffering, come on now, uh, and in the power of his resurrection. And, and so I'm going to be with you just a little bit more in, in the suffering. And then at some point, something supernatural happens. I promise you. It may be six months, it may be six years. I don't know when, but I promise you something supernatural will happen here's what's going to happen at some point you're going to wake up one day and you're going to you're going to choose extravagant giving over extravagant living i promise you it's going to happen so until that day what you do put pause to yourself act like you're that case even if you don't feel like it so here's how we do here's how we develop a lifestyle pre-decide what your percentage of giving is going to be. I mean your money. I'm also talking about your time and your skills. But right now I want to emphasize money because y'all don't like church folk talk about money. So I mean, that's why I'm going to push you on it. Say money. No, no, no. You didn't say it loud enough. Say money. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about your God. Come on now. I'm talking about the thing that has power over your life. And you know that it no longer has power over your life when you're able to freely give it away. Because it can't save you. But it can get you in league with Jesus' mission. So pre-decide what most people, when they count up the money they give in church, for example, is about 1%. If that. If you add in a non-profit, maybe 1.5%. How much are you giving? If you're a disciple of Christ and you're part of a church, you ought to have a 
Here's a plan to support my church, financial plan. And so you need to predecide. The Bible gives us a predecision. It says 10%. Shout 10%. It should, should be your goal. But for some of you, that may be too big of a leap. So you just sort of figure out some figure between zero and 10% that is a stretch for you. That requires you to trust God a little bit. And then each year, just move it up. Some of us, 10% is too low. Because the text really says your tithes and offerings. For some of us, 10% really too low. I know somebody who gives away 50% of his income every year. The question is, what is God saying to you that you need to give? Now, so if you're part of this church, you ought to go on the computer, automatically set up a giving thing, and say, this percentage I'm going to give. Watch this. Secondly, everybody shout, give generously first. Say, give generously first. You ought to go set that up, figure out what it is, talk to your family, figure out what it is, and do that. Give. First, before you pay your bills, before your taxes, all that, give God the first. He says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and I'll take care of the rest. Take care of God's business, he'll take care of your business. For some of you, you may not trust us that way. You may say, I don't know you that well. <laughs> That's okay. Don't give here. But you still got to give if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, if you want him to work in your life. So find a church you know. If you don't want to find a church, there are thousands of nonprofits out there that's working with poor people and trying to repair the breach in the world. Find one of those nonprofits and decide, I'm going to give 5%, 7%, 10%, 15%. I'm going to give first because I want to be more and more like Jesus. And then make the decision. It's easy to write a check for some of y'all. That's why we're teaching you, don't just write a check. At least once a year, show up and put your hands and skills. Give your, your time is more valuable sometimes than your money. Pre-decide. Pre-decide what percentage. Do that today. Go home. That's your homework. Set it up on your computer automatically and walk away and watch God Blow your mind. Give God a hand, praise. That's it.